Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father, as we have just heard, the songwriter writes the words, I'll listen to truth. I'll obey truth. Father, help us not to just listen, but help us to obey. Obey your word. And that, Father, we can become stronger as Christians, that we can live a life victorious in Christ Jesus. And as Satan has so much to offer all of us in tempting us to turn our backs on our Savior and to walk in the things of the world, Father, help us to not listen to that voice, that lie, but help us to listen to the voice of truth, your Bible. So, Father, give us ears to hear, give us a mind to understand, and a heart to comprehend what you have for each one of us, this preacher included today. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. Judges chapter 13, we're going to start a series, if you've already read the welcome in the bulletin, I hope you do, each and every week. I pin down some words on Wednesday, usually, so I'm not a prophet, I can't I can't predict what's going to happen. I know what we've planned, but sometimes it gets a little sketchy. Uh, Michelle, my assistant, is away uh, this week, and so I've, I've even written the welcome for next week. But we're doing a series, and the series on the life of Samson. How many of you know Samson of the Bible? How many of you have read or you have a basic knowledge of, of Samson? Uh, I was reading, uh, uh, doing a lot of studying this week on, on this topic, and and uh, one writer, one commentator says that he believes that Sam was a little peep squeak. Or Samson was a little peep squeak. And uh, he, he just, it wasn't but the power of God on his life that, that gave him that power. And uh, we might touch on that a little bit. I, I like to think of Samson, big old strong guy, you know. But, but he did some mighty stupid stuff, didn't he? Yeah, he did. He really did. And so we'll get into that. Everything that God wants you or me to be, God has already equipped us to have that. He's given us the Holy Spirit. You see, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came and went. Came and went. It fell upon the people, and then it would move. Uh, the children of Israel, they did right in the, in the eyes of God, and then they rebelled against God. They did wicked things against God, and then they fell on their knees and they repented, and, and then, uh, then they were in right standing with God again, and God moved again. The, the, the power of God moved on their lives again. It came and it went. We live now in the age of grace, and the Holy Spirit indwells within us. And we'll have, we have all the Holy Spirit we'll ever get the day that you trusted Christ as your Savior. The question is, does the Holy Spirit have all of you? That's a big difference. And so God has equipped us with the Holy Spirit that lives within us, and we know when we've done right, and we know when we've done wrong. But everything that God intends us, the army had a slogan, be all that you can be, join the army. But be all that you can be, Christian, join God's army. And that, that takes commitment. And that takes willpower. One of the strongest men in the world was also one of the weakest men in the world, Samson. But God has given us everything that we need. He's equipped us with the Word of God, the living Word of God, and He's equipped us with the Holy Spirit in our lives. How many of you remember the movie Castaway? Anybody remember that movie? Tom Hanks. Wilson. I loved Wilson. Remember Wilson? He was the volleyball. Volleyball is made by Wilson. <laughs> so Tom's, Tom Hanks is a FedEx employee, executive, flying in their FedEx jet, and uh, the jet goes down and crashes. And he's left to be on an island. <laughs> and and, and one, of the, one of the contents of the plane was, was this Wilson ball. You know, he opened it up. It was in a package, of course, duh. And uh, there's Wilson. So he put, 
he put hair on it, and that was his friend. It was just him on the island. That was it. He and Wilson. And then in 19, just after that movie came out, uh, the Super Bowl 37, there was a FedEx commercial that came out. And um, uh, there was a guy that walked up to a house in a suburban home, and uh, he was a FedEx employee in this commercial. And he was, looked like Tom Hanks in the movie. And um, he walks up to this house, and he has a package in his hand. And when the lady comes to the door, he explains that he survived five years on a deserted island. And during that whole time, he kept this package in order to deliver it to her. So he gives it to her, and she simply says, thank you. <laughs> but he is curious about what is in the package that he had been protecting for five long years. And he says, if I may ask, ma'am, what was in that package after all? Mind you, he's stranded on an island, saw nobody, didn't know where he was for five years. And she opens it and shows him the contents and says, oh, nothing really, just a satellite tel uh, telephone, a GPS device, a compass, a water purifier, and some seeds. <laughs> And like the contents in that package, God has given us, through the power of the Holy Spirit, everything we need if we are yielded to the Holy Spirit. I'm preaching to me now. So if you're a follower of Christ, you listen carefully this morning. God wants to raise up some spiritual leaders from people right here in this room who He can use to make a tremendous difference in the world. One of the saddest verses in the Bible is Ezekiel twenty two thirty. No need to go there. Listen carefully. Ezekiel twenty two thirty. And God says, And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it. But I found none. God says, I looked for a man, but how many did he find? Zippo, zero, nada, not one. Not one man who would stand in the gap. And maybe if God was speaking this verse today, he would say, I'm looking for a man of integrity. I'm looking for a man of courage. I'm looking for a man who will stand up for those who cannot stand up for themselves. I'm looking for a man who would lay down his life to serve his bride as Christ laid down his life to serve the church. I'm looking for a man who would speak and model spiritual truth to the next generation. I'm looking for a man who would stand in the gap. And I believe with all my heart, if God looked for such a man or a woman at this church, he'd find quite a few. I believe that God would, some, would, 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 would find some people here. Years ago, there was a man by the name of Henry Varley in England, and he was talking to a young man from Chicago, U.S. of A., who was visiting England, and he said this, the world has yet to see what God can do through a man who is totally surrendered unto him. The young man that heard that took it to heart. His name was D.L. Moody. And Moody heard those words and let them sink in and, and, and thought about them. And it was like they started burning inside of him. And a year later, he came back to England and he went up to that gentleman who made that statement. He said, do you remember what you said to me? And Varley said, I, I, honestly, I can't remember word for word. But Moody reminded him, you said, the world has yet to see what God can do through a man who is totally surrendered unto him. Then Moody said, I am that man. And D.L. Moody became one of the greatest evangelists of the last several hundred years. God is looking for men and women of integrity men and women of honor, men and women of, of courage and faithfulness. And today we're going to be starting a study, and this will go for probably at least five more weeks from today. I don't want to get into the holidays. We'll do, have messages for that. But if you want to read, and go ahead and read ahead. It's, uh, we're, I've told you to turn to chapter 13 of Judges, and uh, you go home this afternoon and read 13 through 16 and see the life of Samson. Samson's accomplishments are amazing. But, but all the time, uh, uh, so are his weaknesses. He was a very strong man, 
when God's power is upon him. Old Testament, remember now. But when he walked away from God, he took his eyes off of God, he looked to self, then you can see the power of God removed from his life. Some of his accomplishments are amazing. In fact, he's a lot like us. Samson had so much good God-given potential, and yet again and again he made bad decisions and pretty much self-destructed. He was a man with lots of potential. I've given you my definition of potential, have I not? You ladies can put on Merle Norman, Mary Kay, Avon. You can look good and smell good. Us men, if we're ugly, mm. That's it. That's it, Rob. We just ugly. But we're men, so we're used to it. That's it. So these two beautiful girls were walking out of this fancy restaurant in Orlando, beautiful restaurant. And uh, here comes, as they were walking out, then a, an ugly guy walked right by them. One girl said, whoo, man, that boy sure is ugly, isn't he? The other girl said, man, he's bone ugly. Boy, he's ugly. And he went out, and the valet brought in a, a brand-new Porsche. And he got in that Porsche. And one girl said, he might be ugly, but he got potential. <laughs> and every one of us, we've got great potential. We'll follow after God. God has given him, just like you, uh, so much potential to make a difference in his life. And yet again and again, he made poor decisions. In fact, it, 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 if I would summarize his life in one statement, Samson was an incredibly strong man with a dangerously weak will. Oh. And that actually describes many of us here. We're strong in many ways. We have lots of resources, education, a lot of connections. We're stronger than we realize which means we have tremendous spiritual potential, but at the same time, we have a dangerously weak will, like Samson did. Let me give you the background, just a summation, a Reader's Digest, if you will, of Samson's life. Moses led, led the children out of Israel, or out of, uh, out of bondage, out of Egypt, rather, and they're out in the wilderness. Moses dies, never went into the promised land. And so then uh, Joshua leads the people into the promised land, and they, uh, they conquered the land, they lived there, but eventually Joshua, he dies. And the people turned away from God, and because of that, God stopped protecting them and blessing them, and so various enemies were able to conquer them. And at the time that we read here in Judges, where Samson was living, the Philistines were in control of Israel. And after years of slavery to the Philistines, God said, hopefully you've learned a lesson, children. So I'm going to raise up a man, the 13th judge, Samson. I'm going to raise him up to help my people get free from bondage of the Philistines. And so God sent an angel to the couple that hadn't been able to conceive. And the angel said, you're going to give birth to a boy. His name will be called Samuel. They did that. They did, and they had the little boy. And from the very beginning of Samson's life, God's spirit started working powerfully in him. And God gave him physical strength. That is beyond anything we could imagine. And the angel to also told Samson, I want you to live by Nazarite law, vows. And you say, well, what in the world is a Nazarite vow? Well, you can go to Numbers. You don't have to turn to you now, but study it up. Numbers chapter 6. I'll give you a simple summation of that. Essentially, there was a, there was a way under the Old Testament, if you were not a, a priest, you could say, I want to I dedicate my life to God and I want to be like the priest, and I'm going to live under these vows. So there's three things that they had to do uh, to live under those vows, to be a, uh, a Nazarite priest. Now, he's just a common person, he's, he's, uh, but, but picked out by God. So a non-priest could say, I'm living by these vows, I'm devoting myself to serve God totally. And there were three vows that were given to see that Samson had to live by. The first vow was no drinking of alcohol. The second vow um, was uh, not cutting the, the hair and then not to touch a dead carcass, a dead animal. Those three things. Number one, don't drink alcohol. No Bud Light, no martinis, no margaritas, Mexican food. 
A person living under Nazarite vows couldn't touch alcohol. We should get our joy. Listen, we should get our joy from obeying and being blessed through the Holy Spirit that lives within us, not the spirit of alcohol. I got on a plane one time coming out of Nicaragua, living there for three and a half months, and any American, uh, as far as the Nicaraguans were concerned, I mean, we all were just a bunch of alcoholics. Everybody, if you're an American, you were a drinker. And I got on the plane, and she offered me a drink. I said, no, ma'am, I'm a, I'm a perfectly well-adjusted American. And she said, you're American, you don't drink? I said, no, ma'am. You bring me the strongest iced tea you got. I'll take that, you know. And, uh, and, and that was well and good. We, sh- we should get our joy from obeying the spirit that lives within us, not from spirits, if you will. If you look at alcohol place, uh, you know, they've got, you know, beer, wine, and spirits. You ever notice that? And it's always plural, spirits, plural. I like the spirit, the spirit of God, singular. The second vow was don't touch anything dead, especially dead people or animals. The third vow was no haircuts. Let your hair grow long. Now, some of you are thinking, well, what's, what's up with that thing? I mean, uh, doesn't God like crew cuts? High and tight, doesn't like that? I could understand the alcohol, maybe the dead things, although that kind of messed you up during hunting season, wouldn't it? But uh, what's the purpose of the hair? Well, here's an example. The hair is an outward appearance of what took place on the inside. We were baptized in the baptismal pool. We were baptized. That's an outward appearance of what's happened on the inside. And a Nazarite would, would, would wear their hair long, and the Bible talks about in the Old Testament that long hair is, is, uh, is wrong of a man and uh, shouldn't have long hair. But, but God says, if you're going to be a Nazarite, then don't cut your hair, and you're going to have that outward sign. And you're going to live by that. I have a wedding band on my left ring finger. It, it's an outward sign that I have been, that I'm married. And uh, I, I'm, I'm still married. 40 some odd years <laughs> I told prime timers Tuesday I, I married up when I married my wife God, I'm so glad that God put us together we were in Bible school she didn't know me she was a girl from the windy city of Chicago and I was from all over being an army brat living all over the place and, and standing in our registration line God put us so we had to talk to each other I still carry in one of my several Bibles, one of my Bibles that I had in Bible school, inside of it is still an empty pack of peanut M&Ms. We sat next to each other. They seated us alphabetically in our class, and my last name, of course, is Porter. Her last name, her maiden name's Reese. So uh, most of the classes that we shared together, we were sitting in close proximity, and I always would just change seats with somebody else so I could sit next to her. And we would share peanut M&M's with each other. <laughs> to this day, we still like peanut M&M's. I have eaten my weight in peanut M&M's, I'm telling you. <laughs> but this ring is an outward appearance of what, what has happened, that I'm married, I'm committed to my wife, Rebecca. So Samson is told by God to live by those three Nazarite vows. Don't drink alcohol, don't touch anything dead, don't cut your hair. And because Samson is set apart for for God, God gives Samson amazing strength. Listen to this. (laughs) He battles a thousand Philistines, uh, men by himself. He, He ripped apart, he took apart a lion, just ripped it with his bare hand, took it apart. Merciful Georgia. He carried... A gate, we'll talk about that later on in the weeks to come. He carried a gate, he just removed the whole gate and carried it on his back for about 40 miles. It weighed anywhere from two to 4,000 pounds. Hello, that's a ton or two tons. This guy was, was when the power of God was on his life, is a cra- it's amazing strength, supernatural strength. And yet with all of this God-given potential, his weak will got him into trouble again and again. We're going to watch Samson betray God for a handful of honey. We're going to watch as the tempter gets the best of him, and he kills 30 innocent men because he lost a bet. Wow, what bet was that? We're going to watch as he lusts for women and gets himself in trouble time and time again. And had so much potential for greatness, and yet again and again he squandered that potential with stupid living. 
How many people have you seen that really uh, are aggressive at work? I mean, they're type A personality. Boy, at work, they're barking dogs. They're a leader on steroids. But then when they get home, they become a little mouse. And they don't lead their family the way they ought to lead their family. They're committed in one place and uncommitted where it matters the most. How many men have you seen that are committed to their finances, their career, their hobby, and yet they can't commit to a woman or a woman can't commit to a man? What's up with that? I know men that will spend hours researching the best rod and reel or the best set of golf clubs or what's the best kind of TV to buy. They'll spend hours watching sports on TV but won't spend five minutes reading God's Word so that they can grow spiritually. Other men truly love God and truly do love their wives. And yet some men with so much potential are locked in a prison of lust, of deception, of destruction with these habits. And they don't want any help. They they don't want to get out of it. So much potential and yet at the same time self-destructing with bad decisions. That was Samson. And I pray, God, don't let me be like that. In fact, my life... His life, Samson's life, shows us three very specific attitudes to make strong men weak. And that's all I've got time for this morning. Three three attitudes. Lust, entitlement, and pride. Let me say that again. Lust, entitlement, and pride. What's lust? When a man sees something that he desires, what does he say? He lusts after it. (coughs) He says, I want it. Got to have it, going to get it. You men in this room, got to put a little growl in your voice. Repeat after me when I say these, those three statements. I want it. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, boy. Come on now. I want it. Got to have it. Going to get it. all of us had to to deal with that we see something we want it we want it now here's satan's philosophy what's thine is mine and what's mine is mine that's what's one of the philosophies of satan what's yours is mine i want it and what's mine is mine Uh uh-uh you see that with your grandkids or you see that with your children for me it's grandkids now I give one of them a sucker, and they go in the other room. Little Pepe says, I want a sucker. And little Jay says, no, it's mine. Where did he get that? We're all born sinners. I've never seen a case. Well, sure, darling, here's my sucker. You can have it, you know. No, that dog doesn't hunt. (laughs) What will happen is a man who wants something like that, who slips into the pattern of lust, he or she forgets about all logic. Maybe he, wants a, maybe he wants a woman or maybe a, a quick fix and he's got a habit, an addiction. But whatever it is, when he wants it, he forgets about logic because I want it, got to have it, going to get it. We see Samson do this. Turn with me to Judges chapter 14 and look at verse number 1. And Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath, the daughter of the Philistines. And he came up and told his father and his mother, and I've seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me to a wife. This commentary says he had to be a little wimp, a little shrimp. I mean, he wouldn't even go talk to her. Mommy, Daddy, will you please go get her for me? You know? And so, I don't know, maybe that was the case. It just blows my, my image of Samson. But anyway, it's wrong image, isn't it? Samson went down to Timnath. He saw this smoking hot young Philistine woman. Oh, I read that between the lines anyway. He had a problem with lust. He was a sucker for hot women. Verse 2, and it says, And it came up and he told his father and his mother, said, Go down there and, and get her for me. You hear what he's saying? I want it. Got to have it. Going to get it. Now what's he going to do here? Even though the Philistines had conquered Israel, the people still lived separately. That's what's going on. Okay, it's like, I, I, if you've ever been to, uh, I've never been to San Francisco, so I've never left my heart there. But I understand that, in, well, I've been to Toronto. 
I've been to uh, uh, other big cities, Chicago and, and New York City. I've been to New York City. New York City, they have a Chicago, uh, Chicago they have a Chinese town, okay? And, and, and that's where all the Chinese hang out. And, and, and then they have uh, an element where all the uh, folks from, uh, from Europe, where all they hang out. And even though the Philistines were in control of, of, uh, of, of Israel, uh, they still live separate from each other. And, and, and uh, Samson's hometown was west of Jerusalem. And he goes about four miles into this town, and he sees this woman in, uh, there in Timnah, and he uh, across the border. And there was, when he saw the woman, that was forbidden to him because God had told the people of Israel, don't intermarry with people who don't worship me. Now you listen. I've had many people ask if, if I would marry them. Number one, I take marriage very seriously. Um, this one lady that I knew for quite some time, uh, I knew her family, and, and she said, would you marry... My, me and my fiance. I said, well, I'd like to have lunch with him, and, with him, and I'd like to ask him a few questions. And then we'll go into premarital counseling. So we're eating at a nice restaurant, and uh, he is sitting on one side of the table, and she and I are on the other side. And I asked him, we t- had small talk, and uh, he was very familiar with... Uh, the, the, uh, we were eating uh, Thai food. He was very familiar with Thai food, and it was really cool. He travels the world. Just a great guy. You, anybody in this room would just love to sit down and talk with him. And so I said, well, why don't you tell me uh, your salvation experience? Now, they're to get married just in a few months. And he looked at me, just stared at me silently. And then he said, I have no idea what you're talking about. And I'm thinking in my brain, this lady is about to marry a man that's not even a Christian. She's a Christian, but he's not a Christian. And so gave him the plan of salvation. Long story short, he makes a profession of, to accept Christ. Marriage didn't last a year. Didn't even last a year. Boy, I tell you, before you step out in marriage, Man, you want to make sure. The Bible says not to be unequally yoked. And I know a lot of ladies will say, but Pastor, I can, I'll change him. Mm, I can give you story after story about that. And so you've got to make sure that you're equally yoked. And so God says, don't marry somebody that's not worshiping me. And the Philistines were not. They were not worshiping God. So Samson sees her, and he, he lust takes over in his life, and he says, I want her, i got to have her, going to get her. Samson says, I don't care what God says, I don't care what my dad and my mom says, I don't care what's right, I don't care what's wise, because I'm a man, I want to have her, I want to get her, I want to get her now. Lust makes strong men weak. Lust will make strong men weak. Second thing we see in this story is <coughs> a spirit of entitlement. Not only do I want it, but I believe that I deserve it. Do we not see that in America today, all over, in every realm? A person would say, I don't feel like I should have to work. Let somebody else pay my bills. I want a free education. Let somebody else pay my, ta- my school. I buy my wife all she needs. I'm entitled to go out and mess around a little. My wife says, I take care of the kids, I clean, I cook. I'm entitled to a night out with some of my divorced girlfriends. Mm. Man, I've seen marriages go down the tube right there. A married girl, happily married, friends of ours for many, many years. When she was eight years old, a chimpanzee bought, bit her thumb off, completely off. Imagine that. Her dad was in a CEO meeting. She busted in, crying, thumb all bleedy. <laughs> they had a chimpanzee and it bit her thumb off. Husband had a fabulous job, making good money, hardworking guy. He was in avionics. And she started riding horses. 
at a horse riding club and it was mostly divorced women. And they got in her ear and said, you can do better than what you got. One day, he had no clue. One day, and that's some guys, I, I tell you, they, I had no clue that something was wrong, you know? Where you been living? And he went home, big, palacious, two-story home, ranch. There was 11 boxes in the center of the living room floor. She had packed herself up, the kids, while he was at work. I mean, she did it all, and just she hired a crew to come in, moved everything. That was his stuff, left in the center. And she drove away and flew completely out of state because she was listening to the wrong thing. Look at, look at Judges 14, verses 5 through 6. Then went Samson down to his father and his mother to Timnah and came to the vineyards of Timnath. And behold, a young lion roared against him, the, not only is not to drink, drink alcohol, he wasn't even supposed to go into vineyards, not even handle grapes, all right? And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he rent him as he would have rent a kid. That's a small goat. And he had nothing in his hands. He didn't have a, a knife, a box cutter, anything like that. But he told not his father or his mother what he had done. Wow. The Spirit of the Old Testament came upon him, and he... He just rent this, 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 this uh, lion in two. We sing the song, Trust and Obey. There's a line in that song, When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, the Bible says. So when we're walking with the Lord, as Adam did in the dew of the morning with God, we're walking with God through reading His Word, through praying, and through listening to the Holy Spirit in our lives, and then we're obeying. What does that song say? Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to what? Trust and obey. That's so vitally important. And God doesn't want you to trust and obey so that He can do evil towards you. He wants to bless you. Now look down at verse number 8. And after a time, He returned and to take her, and He turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. I mean, I don't know how much time's taking place, but I'm sure it's some time because the bees have made a hive inside of this carcass. So there had to be some time. And bees can make a hive real quick. I don't know how, long, how, how quick they can make honey, but they can make a hive real, real quick. I've seen that many a time. And behold, there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. And he took thereof in his hands and went out on eating and came to his father and mother and gave, hey, you want some honey? And gave them some honey, and they did eat. But he told them not that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. Why? Because one of his uh, vows is he's not to touch a dead animal. But the real point is, what was Satan supposed, uh, what was not supposed to touch? He wasn't supposed to touch an animal. And he did it for a handful of honey. Are you kidding me? Just for a handful of honey. See how illogical that is? I'm going to give up my vow to God. I'm going to give up the power that God, has, that God puts upon me. I'm going to give that up for some honey. Duh. Who would be so stupid enough to betray God for a handful of honey? It's the most ridiculous thing. Yet the truth is, people all around us do it every single day. We betray our God who blessed us in so many ways. We do it for the stupidest, the most sinful things that only hurt us and, and hurt those around us. You be careful when we sin, when I sin, when you sin, it not only hurts you, but it'll hurt those and it'll impact the lives of people around you. Sin will take you further than you want to go. It'll cost you more than you want to pay and it'll cause you to stay longer than you want to stay. And then we do it for entitlement. It's, 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 I, I deserve it. And then lastly, pride. The third attitude that makes strong men weak is pride. What do we... What, what do you think, men? We, we think, oh, I can handle it. I'm strong. I can handle it. Look at verse number 10. So the father went down to the woman, and Samson made there a feast, for so used the young men to do it. Let me tell you about this feast. This feast was nothing but a keg party. The word feast here in the, in the, in the, in the original, in the Hebrew, is misteth, M-I-S-H-T-E-S-H. The literal meaning is a drinking party. It wasn't some sit-down formal a uh, bachelor party. It was, as I said, it was a kegger. Now hold on. Those three vows, not to cut the hair, not to touch a dead animal, 
we hadn't even touched on hair yet. And then it was, it was don't drink alcohol. So he purposely has this drunken party. So next Sunday, we'll see what Samson gets himself into in this drunken party. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. For all of sin, it comes short of the glory of God. We don't deserve anything. The only thing we deserve is hell. But God, in his grace and his mercy, commendeth his love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But when we follow Christ and put our hope in him, then God, in his goodness, gives us everything. He gives us life. And with that life comes heartache, fear. Don't ever tell a person, oh, why don't you trust Christ? Your life will be perfect from now on. Huh. Huh. Life will be life. And there's ups and there's downs. But boy, I have found that I can handle those ups and those downs a lot better with Christ leading me through those things. It's incredible. We're all sinners. I'm a sinner. We're all of us are sinners. And I'm not here picking on any, any one person. I'm just saying, this is what the Word of God has to say. What, what I walk away from this today is, if I choose to disobey a holy God that loves me and wants to give me favor and wants to give me joy and wants to give me uh, uh, victory through the trials that I have to go through, then, then, then I, I, need to, I need to trust in the Holy Spirit that lives within me, and I need to obey the Holy Spirit. I need to do right. When I'm walking with God, and I'm in tune with God, and I'm fellowshipping with God, and I abstain from sin, listen, my life is so much better. There's joy. There's, there's that joy unspeakable the, the Bible talks about. You know what I'm talking about. And, and, and when, we're, when we're disobeying, when we're just doing for self, and we, we, have, we have pride in our life, and we, have, we, we think we, we've earned it. I mean, even preachers will say, I've, I, listen, I've been in this for so long, I deserve this. And you better be careful about that. We don't deserve anything. It's all God. To God be the glory. I said, God, whatever you have me to do, let me do it with all my strength. And whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God, the Bible says. Whether you eat or drink, whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. On Wednesday nights, we're studying about the glory of God and about how can we as Christians give glory to God. And these kind of go hand in hand. So I walk away from this is, hey, I want to walk, I want to walk with God. And when I don't walk with God, I, I do the stupidest things, the most illogical things. I give up the blessings for a handful of honey. I touch unclean things for a handful of honey. Oh, let us be people of God that say, I, God, I, I want the best that you have for me. God doesn't want to harm us. He doesn't want to hurt us. He wants, to, he wants the best for us. He really does. 